Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sarah Mancall, and I'm the Policy Director here at the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. We go by SPICI, and we are also known within the APA community as APA Division 9. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is Qualitative Research Methods and Ethics, Understanding Lived Experience. Our presenter today is prominent researcher and methodologist, Dr. Frederick J. Wirtz. He is Dean of Fordham College, past chair of the Fordham Psychology Department, and past president of APA Divisions 24 and 32. Just a little bit about today's organizers. This webinar is just the first in a series of webinars that are being sponsored by the AD, APA CODEPAR funded grant project on immigrant and refugee advocacy. The project is being spearheaded by APA Division 24 in collaboration with APA Divisions 5, 9, 27, 32, 37, 39, 45, 48, 52, and 56. Just a few notes before we begin. We will have a little bit of time for question and answer at the end. If we don't get to your question, uh, Dr. Wartz is posting his email address on the last slide, and you are welcome to email him to follow up with any questions. We also have an, an acknowledgement slide toward the end of the slideshow. If you do not see your name or your division or organization there, please let me know, and we will add it for next time. And uh, I will be sending out an advertisement for our next webinar as soon as we have it. And I'll be sure to send it to everyone who RSVP'd for today's webinar. And with that said, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Wirth. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you today. And I should say that we're going to be covering a vast territory. And uh, we have many people with different backgrounds. Some perhaps expert researchers, others who have not done any research. So what I'm going to do is to try to give you an overview that's comprehensive regarding qualitative research methods and goes into a little bit of depth, but it's gonna be more depth than we're gonna be able to talk about in the webinar. So fortunately, because it's recorded, you'll be able to come back and go through it again and look at some of the slides that contain more detail than we'll really be able to discuss. So I will pause on each slide, even if I don't have chance to go through all the material on it, in the hope that if you are interested, you'll come back again and take a closer look at it. Our goals of the webinar are to offer you some basic knowledge of the history and philosophy of science, particularly the rise of qualitative human science research methods, which has really been an incredible thing that's happened throughout history, but culminated in the last 20 years. I want you to have a basic knowledge of the contemporary models and tools of researching human lived experience, the various systems of inquiry, ways of collecting data, and the analytic procedures that you can use. And of course, also very important is to have an ethical awareness and to understand the principles guiding research uh, on the ethical level and to be on the lookout to always be protecting human participants. As we go through this webinar, we'll have some preliminary considerations on researching the lived experience of refugees and immigrants, as well as the professionals who are helping them. So in this section, we will start with the historical overview. We'll get into various human science research methods, including the models and tools of data collection analysis. Then we'll go through the principles of ethics, including a little bit of the history and means of protecting human subjects. I'll introduce the structure of the research project at the beginning of the webinar and then return to it at the end, so that in case we have time for questions, you can be looking at this structure and thinking about research you might wanna do, and we can address those questions uh, in light of that structure. Finally, I have a bunch of bibliographic resources at the end of the presentation that you can come back to and access and use a lot of these materials. I have many of them in PDF, so for those of you who don't have access to libraries, feel free to email me and maybe I can send you a lot of the resources that I'm providing. I love this quote of W.E.B. Du Bois, 
who says that the sole aim of any society is to settle its problems in accordance with its highest ideals. And the only rational method of accomplishing this is to study those problems in light of the best scientific research. What's amazing about W.E.B. Du Bois is that even though he was doing a lot of his research at the end of the 1800s, he was extremely sophisticated in his methods. He used virtually every method that we now are going to be going over today, and he integrated them all. And it was long before there were any methodological texts to guide him, and yet he used all the qualitative methods will be going over and integrated them with quantitative methods. So I really urge you to take a look at his work because it's so absolutely masterful. And fortunately, in over 100 years since he did his research, we have a lot of books on methodology and resources to be able to think more fully and systematically about what he was doing by virtue of his brilliance. So in this section, we'll take a look at the meaning of science, uh, something that's very problematic and that I'd like us to think about and think in the most expansive way about, because I think what we've seen in the last few years is a real explosion in the meaning of what science is. But first, we'll take a look at the rise of natural science, technology, and positivistic philosophy of science. Then we'll look at the critique of that approach, critique of positivism, and what's called methodolatry. That would mean the idol of method that is worshipped by those who follow natural science methods in, their, in, in all research and reduce all science to natural science. What we'll see historically is the emergence of many different methods, particularly those that are appropriate for studying human lived experience. And what we now have is a real methodological pluralism, all kinds of models and resources and tools that I hope to introduce to you today that has really led to a kind of democratization of knowledge in the qualitative revolution. So that all of us, whether we are experienced scientists and researchers or, or just novices starting out, can start to use all these tools. I think it's helpful to think of science as the wedding of rationality and observation. It goes all the way back to the Greeks, and the whole question is, what is rationality? What kind of observations can we relate to our thinking? And it's also important to recognize that science from the beginning has been for a purpose, and that is the responsible shaping of our destiny, uh, really making the world a better place. We go back to Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, who is often associated with natural science research, but what's so important about Bacon is he put a premium on observation, observing the world, close contact with the world, and developing ideas out of what we observe in the world is the basis of science, and I think it's not only the basis of natural science, but of all the social sciences and really all the sciences. Compt, called for the limitation of observable to observables, focus only on observables, and he extended that through all the social sciences. He was a very interesting guy. Uh, he was a humanist, and he even viewed science as a religion uh, and formed the Church of Humanity, which can now be found in London, Paris, New York, and even Rio de Janeiro. Logical positivism grew up in the early 1900s, extending universally the natural science methods to all other human sciences. And this involves hypothesis testing by controlled experiment. It's still done in medicine and many physical sciences today and pervades the social sciences as well, sociology, anthropology, psychology. And here we see Sir Francis Bacon, observation, August Comte, and the Vienna Circle, logical positivism. But particularly since then, uh, questions have been raised about what is rationality. And one of the scholarly approaches to raise these questions is phenomenology, which began to question the application of natural science methods to lived experience from the early 1900s and developed methods of studying lived experience that the physical sciences had not been able to muster. It was really in the 1960s that 
history started to make a turn and to question what is rationality? And Kuhn's study of scientific revolutions showed that science is very much related to society and its conventions and its purposes and its methods, and that it goes through a series of revolutions that are structured by confronting new phenomena and developing new approaches to study them. Wittgenstein has informed us about the importance of language and how much language structures our knowledge. The Frankfurt School has critiqued ideology and has made us much more reflective on the ideologies guiding scientific work. Foucault has taught us that knowledge is power and oftentimes science is put in the service of power that we have to look at very critically and be very concerned about how knowledge is being used by the powerful and how it affects the disempowered. Fortunately, we've had extensions of critical theory in feminism and multiculturalism that have made us aware of issues of gender and politics, uh, critiques of sexism and colonialism. Here we see Thomas Kuhn and Theodore Adorno of the Frankfurt School, wonderful books that you can check out. But it was really the period of 1960 to 1980, time of social turmoil, the 1960s. And I think it was really the social uprising of practitioners who were saying that science is not adequately guiding their practice, of women calling to att call our attention to feminism and the inequality between the genders, uh, coming to emphasize women's ways of knowing and recognizing that science had been to a great extent done by males and indeed white males. Uh, cultures outside of the West, all over the world, began to recognize that Western science was not the only way of knowing and that every culture has its own indigenous ways of knowing. And so a kind of an ethnic pluralism started to flourish and a multiculturalism started to come into science. So now my idea of universal science would be that it would draw on every culture. It would draw on previously disempowered persons, both genders, and use all those methods to confront uh, problems of lived experience and, and our human social existence. So these critical turns in the 60s through the 80s really produced a crisis. What is knowledge? What is science? Uh, whose authority is in play here? Uh, how is power being distributed throughout our society and in particular in the process of acquiring knowledge? And what followed this critical turn and actually accompanied it, but uh, especially became very well known after the revolution uh, is the qualitative research revolution, which brought to us an unexpected transformation in the social sciences. Now, it's really interesting to note that philosophers of science like Diltai and Brentano had argued for qualitative research, had argued for unique methods to study lived experience at the end of the 1800s, but these never entered into our methodological education. There were people like Du Bois who were practicing these methods, William James, Sigmund Freud, Gordon Alpert, and many others through the 1900s, but these methods were never taught in our textbooks. It was only in the 1960s with these countercultural critiques, a crisis of authority and the privilege of certain scientists, the rise of disempowered and marginalized people, women, ethnic minorities, non-industrialized cultures, and the poor, that started to question science and to develop new methods. Interestingly, it's not a political thing entirely. It's really driven, I believe, fundamentally by ethics. It's driven by a new impulse to respect the other, to respect every person, even those who don't have power in our society. And so we've really seen since 1995 uh, and by the way, qualitative research, the term really came into play around 1985, relatively late. And so it's really in this period between 1995 and the present that we see a flourishing of conferences, journals, organizations, university positions, and even a section in APA Division 5, which changed its name to quantitative and qualitative methods. These developments have led to a real pluralism, many different approaches that we can draw on and that I'll be going through today, including the existential phenomenological, ethnographic, 
uh, reflective practice. Uh, Donald Schoen wrote a brilliant book in 1982 that I highly recommend. Community-based action research, pragmatic research, narrative research, post-positivist research, mixed methods research. And we find a breakdown of interdisciplinary boundary, interdisciplinarity and a breakdown of boundaries. So we have psychology and sociology, as it did with Du Bois, coming together in research projects. So that economics, history, philosophy, psychology, uh, and political science can all be part of the exploration of lived experience now and can even fuse with journalism and the arts and, uh, and and so this is what makes our research methods nowadays so exciting, that science, the humanities, and the fine and performing arts can all be brought into the research process. Nowadays, we can do descriptive research. We can be person-centered and take individuals and explore their own lived experience, whether they're patients or migrants or uh, refugees the providers, the administrators, politicians, policymakers. We can also be very reflective and study our own personal processes, our own professional experience, our own experiences in the world. We can do historical research, exploring lives through time, both personal and cultural. There's a tremendous pragmatic flair in contemporary research, studying practices, treatments, interventions, how effective they are, ways of assessing people's needs of individuals, of groups, of community, evaluating policies, and including all the stakeholders from governmental officials and policymakers to the clients, to those served, to the professionals involved in systems, to the business interests that provide the economics of programs. And, and there's a great emphasis on collaboratory research that's participatory and related to communities and action. So here's a kind of a map of the structure of the research project, which starts with the topic. What is the topic? And the main thing about the topic is it should be important. It should be there in reality. And we should be able to say why it's important, how it's important. Research always fills in a gap between what we know and the reality that's still unknown. And so we can sometimes find those gaps between knowledge and reality through reviewing the literature. But sometimes we find it in practical challenges of our work every day. Sometimes we find it in communities and personal interests. And when we go to institutions or say we went to the Mexican border, we would be guests and there would be guest host relationships that might inform us of problems, of issues, of things that need to be known. And finally, moral obligation may animate research. The method always involves some participants, data collection, data handling, findings, uh, discussion, dissemination. But the principles underlying methods, the way that we design research and the way we evaluate it, really comes down to two principles that were developed by a task force of SQIP uh, in Division Five of APA, led by Heidi Levitt, that identified the two principles and aspirations of research as fidelity. We're always trying to achieve maximum closeness to reality. We want intimacy. We want closeness. We want fidelity. And so you can look at every part of the research project to see, is it bringing us close to reality? Is it in touch with reality? How well is it bringing us into that intimate connection with reality? And utility. Every part of our research project should fulfill our purpose. It should fulfill the purpose of the problem we're solving, the topic we want to know, and that methods should interrelate with each other to cohesively work together. Uh, so utility is about the working of methods. Do they work? Do they fulfill our purposes? And we'll come back to that again uh, at the end of the presentation today. Some of the tools and methods that we'll be looking at will be program evaluation, ethnology, action research, community engaged partnerships, oral history, case study, liberation approaches, indigenous methodologies, expressive methods, and artistic media, 
even mixed methods. And we'll be looking at many ways of data collection. I'll emphasize the interview because I know many researchers use the interview. And so we'll take a special look at that, but we'll also look at focus groups, critical incident technique, the use of art, photography, drawing fiction, and poetry. Program development and evaluation always starts with a problem and a need identification. What's the need for the program? Who needs the program? Why do they need the program? What are their purposes? And we can involve literature review, read up on it. We can observe the real world. We can use our own experience with programs. We can get very important in program development to get input from all the various stakeholders, from the people who who, who offer the program, to those served by the program, to all the economic interests, the policies underlying the program, and interviewing all stakeholders about their values, their purposes, their practices, their experiences, is really crucial to developing and evaluating programs. Maybe I'll move on to the next, uh, the next section of ethnography, which is a study of people, cultures, places, institutions that may be unfamiliar to us. We usually do these studies in natural settings where the people live. It's really important to join with the people we're studying and to join with all our informants, to participate, to become a part of their lives with great respect and connection with the leaders who become our guides, translators, those who dwell in the situation, and respecting their ways, respecting their norms, respecting their values. Ethnography can use multiple data sources, documents, interviews, observations, field notes, and very important is checking in on ourselves. Where are we coming from? What are our values? What are our purposes? What's our relationship with the people we're studying? Is it a good relationship? And part of that process can involve what's called now autoethnography, studying our own experiences amidst people who may be foreign or who may be different from us. And that's a part, again, of the research situation. It's a part of the world. And so it's a part of scientific rationality to include ourselves in investigations. You see here some gangs of, 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 of migrants. You see people amidst uh, refugees, you see a detention center with a security person, children, parents. Going into these situations is what ethnography and autoethnography is all about. One of the traditions that we can also draw on, and by the way, these are all uh, combinable. They're all actually very, the borders between all these different models are very porous. So uh, par the participatory action research developed by Kurt Levine is, is an approach that attempts to, com to join people in the world, to develop research pro projects with people, not on them, to see what their problems, what their interests, what their needs are and to let them define the researcher's problem. All too often in research, it was done through the ivory, through a kind of an ivory tower. It served researchers, their careers, and not so much the people who were being researched. But now we have a great tradition of participatory action research, where research is embedded in uh, the work of people in the world and people who are being served by researchers who often become co-researchers and learn how to be researchers. Community and engaged partnerships between universities and between researchers and people in community are really crucial. They're based on relationships and they draw on the strengths and capacities of all the people who enter into the relationships in which research is embedded. Community-engaged research is critical of academic research problems and interests, say in public health, that are defined purely by academicians or scholars. Research that's community-engaged involves leaders and members of communities, and, and this can be involved in all stages of research, from the formulation of problems, to the data collection, to the analysis, and to the dissemination of the results. Who is it for? And the community can be involved in every aspect of decision-making, data collection, 
and analysis. We see here a few photographs of community-based research, uh, research with attorneys volunteering and helping migrants and refugees, for instance. Oral history is a powerful model for research. Taking a look at the time of life, what people have gone through in their individual lives, in their collective lives as groups and communities, in their family lives. It could look at the history of institutions. It could look at the history of communities, places, individuals, events. Uh, oftentimes interviews can be audio tape, videotape, transcribed. Uh, sometimes libraries and archives are helpful in oral history. Oftentimes open-ended interviews and life review is used. You see here some oral, in oral history interviews. Uh, you see one man locating his, his, his voyage on a map where he came from uh, and informing the researcher. I want to draw your attention to a project uh, of oral history that's been done at my university. It's called the Bronx African American History Project. You can check it out on the website below. It's absolutely incredible. It was done in the Bronx, uh, looking at the oral history of African Americans living in the Bronx since the 1930s. All these interviews ha are downloadable now. They've been made into archives. Uh, and this research was based on partnerships with community leaders and community residents. And they participated in every aspect of the research. And so check out this uh, website. It's all documented there and has become as a website, a resource for researchers all over the country that have brought new dignity and respect and pride to communities in the Bronx. You see here a symposium at Fordham where the community leaders and the university researchers were talking about their work together. Case study is another model of research. It might study particular persons, groups, events, decisions, projects, programs, policies, institutions. It goes back in the natural sciences as far as Galileo's study of gravity. There are many case studies in clinical medicine. There's great value of going into depth on individual cases. And one of the things that's always criticized about case studies is that they don't generalize. But I would argue that case studies are most interesting and they're usually done because the individuals and the study of individuals does yield gen general insights. Case study, you know, we're not all alone. An individual person and what they live through is often lived through by many other people as well. So a case study can be an excellent point of generalization from the ground up, as it is in case law. All of jurisprudence works on cases. And so when lawyer has a new problem, they look at cases. They look at the history of cases like that. And so case law is a fantastic area that's based on case studies, but uh, works toward general knowledge. Clinical research too, and program evaluation. I recommend a book by John Berger and John Moore, uh, the photographer, fortunate man, studying a physician in rural England. Fantastic case study. And here you see an individual, could be a parent and child, could be a migrant who will show you her photographs, her own photographs. This is a former gang member in the lower right who has migrated New York North after many transformations in his own life. Interesting possibility for a case study. Case studies can focus on families. They can focus on places. What's going on in that place? What's its history? What's its uses? What's its meanings to the people who dwell there? and can study both people who are captives, who are detained, or people who are volunteers and working on those problems. One of the great models in contemporary research is liberation approaches. And the goal here is to liberate people who are not empowered. The goal is achieve, to achieve social justice, particularly the empowerment of marginalized people. 
And it's rooted in liberation theology, again, the interdisciplinary aspects of qualitative research. Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, liberation psychology, Paulo Freire, uh, the Brazilian educator, Ignacio Martin Barro, the Jesuit, who was killed in El Salvador as part of his work, and a wonderful book by Mary Watkins and her colleague Schulman. Here you see uh, Martin Barreau and the book Liberation Psychologies, which studies all the various liberation psychologies with a huge and very fruitful chapter on liberation methodology, liberation research methodology. One of the tremendous uh, fruits of liberation research uh, is, a, is a kind of research called testimonio. It's a case study of a particular person, but a very special person, a person whose life and a person whose study and whose voice expresses not just themselves as an isolated individual, but really expresses the lived experience of a people. And that's a people rooted in history, caught up with politics, economics, sociology, psychology, and it takes research broadly into the cultural context, the historical context, the economics, but it's all put in the first person as a person who's speaking out what it's been like to live as, for instance, an Indian woman in Guatemala, Rigoberto Menchu, who won the Nobel Prize in 1992. So any person could be the, uh, the subject of uh, a testimonio. I won't dwell too much on indigenous methodologies, but what's wonderful about the rationality of science as it's evolving now is that it can include the methods, the ways of knowing of people who have been considered uh, non-scientific, who have been considered to use spiritual methods. Uh, many of the non-Western cultures uh, have their own ways of knowing have their own traditions, have their own conceptual frameworks, have their own practices, have their own ways of disseminating knowledge. And we've had a wonderful critique of colonialism and an overthrow, overthrow of colonialism in many parts of the world where indigenous people have tried to return to their own ways of knowing. And I think even as we go to other cultures, say in ethnography, it's always important to be aware of the fact that the people we're studying and the peoples we're studying have their own ways of knowing. It's not just we who are methodologists. Well, we may be the methodologists, but they may have methods that we can help them give words to, give form to, and they can teach us so much about methods that may be very foreign to us. Oftentimes they may be spiritual ways of knowing, uh, which are very different from those of Western science. And so scientific rationality may actually include human spirituality. You see here some, some photographs of indigenous ways of knowing. One of the great things about our uh, contemporary research methods is the use of expressive and artistic approaches, performative research, research that can use drama, theater, film, uh, that can focus on the people in life as agents in their performances. And theatricality itself can be a way of knowing, it can be a heuristic, it can be a method of understanding. And we can express the results of our research projects in the performative arts can use visual media, photography, video. We can study graffiti. And these expressive and artistic approaches can be used alone. One can have a whole project operating within this model, or it can be incorporated into what we might call mixed methods research, drawing on multiple models. For instance, here we see a couple of performances, one with film, one with, with theater, with drama. And then there's the possibility of visual storytelling, which could involve photographs. It could involve photographs like this of migrants, refugees, or it can involve children and their drawings. You see these wonderful drawings of children, of their families, of the situation they're fleeing, of the tremendous voyage and treacherous voyage to where they wanna go 
to detention, to waiting. We see communities and the graffiti on the ground that can all be part of our research. Journals with diagrams, with drawings, with sketches. Cell phones are fantastic because every so many people have cell phones and are recording reality. This can enable our research to be very, very high fidelity. So I want to turn now to data collection and look at some of the various ways uh, that we collect data. You see here the interview, focus groups, using documents, measuring instruments and quantification when we want to study populations and know how lived experience is distributed across the large aggregates of people. Du Bois did that brilliantly. He interviewed former slaves in the South, and yet he gave all kinds of statistics on their educational levels and how they changed after, uh, after, the, after they were freed. Uh, and so all the economics and stat statistics of uh, black Americans in the South were studied along with the most intimate narratives. And uh, at the beginning of each chapter of Du Bois's uh, study, uh, he used blues lyrics because he recognized that the indigenous ways of knowing of the slaves, since they were not allowed to be literate, were expressed, their knowledge was expressed in music. So their lyrics and their music was their way of expressing their knowledge, and he valued that. So he was a precursor of indigenous methods in his study. And we now have photography, video, creative expression. You can see here letters from detention centers, cell phones, uh, photographs, uh, interviews, so many forms of data. I want to talk a little bit about interviewing, and there are many ways of interviewing in more structured ways and more open-ended ways and ways that we go in with a kind of a guide of areas or questions that we're interested in. Interviewing is not always just the beginning of a research project. It could be done throughout, even after analysis is done, as grounded theory does with what they call theoretical sampling, going back to participants, going back to reality, and sampling it more after one has a better understanding of what's going, going on there. But the goal of interviewing is what we call thick, concrete descriptions, real life events, rather than generalizations, opinions, hunches, ungrounded data. And it's always collaborative. It always involves a relationship. And therefore, it's very important to reflect on the relationship. I've been always looking for a great book on interviewing, and this is the best I've ever found. One of our APA colleagues, Ruth Ellen Josselson, really recommend you're getting it and reading it if you're going to be doing interviews. It's very accessible, and it's absolutely fantastic. Some of the things that Ruth Ellen brings to light is the fact that an interview always involves a relationship. It's actually better to look at it as a relationship than collecting data. It's really important for interviewers to take stock of their preconceptions because good research will always explode our preconceptions. We're always looking for something that goes beyond what we already know, what we already think. We're going to be enlarged, corrected by an interview. Really imp important to be upfront when we talk with people who may, who may be interview partners to state our goals, our topics, and why they're important, why we value them in our research. The aim of the interview is to understand without judgment and without any interference. So interviewers are minimally self-disclosive. It's really about the other person. Qualities like sincerity, openness, and acknowledged naivete, but genuine interest and hope, receptivity are really important. There are some logistics here like checking tape recorders, or if you don't have a tape recorder, just listen, take notes. Transcription is important. You can include the nonverbal in your transcriptions. Report the context, the relationship, the feelings. At the beginning of an interview, the place and materials are important ideally private, to have a kind of a distance, maybe a low table, a tape recorder, some questions to help, 
But none of that is necessary. An interview can really be done in any context. It's what's more important is the attitude, the self-presentation of the researcher, the researcher's earnestness, seriousness, it's the interestedness, being relaxed, and that infuses one's clothes, one's look. Uh, and it's it may be important to demonstrate uh, background knowledge, but also background ignorance, and to be clear on why the research is important. The tone, serious, friendly, comfortable, uh, straightforward, be for real. Uh, and most of all, I'd say, show the interviewer that you really want to know their experience, their relationship with the topic. And always interviews are done with the consent of the interviewees. And that's done before the interview so that it's voluntary from start to finish. The interview proper, and this is from Josselson, says, you know, rather than even asking questions or a series of questions, it may be better to just give an invitation to uh, welcome the participant to the interview and say, this is my topic. Tell me your story. Tell me what you've been through. Start at the beginning. Walk me through the whole thing, right up till now or right up through the relevant topic. So you communicate your research focus, share your purpose, give them a sense of your topical interest and what's relevant. And from then on, Ruth Ellen says, don't ask questions. Rather, reflect back what you're understanding so that they can correct you. Invite further detail and elaboration. If the interviewee gives generalizations, ask them for an example. Ask them for an incident in real time and to walk through the most concreteness of the life that they've lived. Give them acceptance, give them interest, give them your wanting to understand, always inviting a deeper description. I'm just gonna check my time here. Here's some best practices in interviewing. And I see we're through 42 minutes, and so I better get going. But here are some practices in interviewing that you can come back to and check out at leisure after this session is recorded. Here are also some common mistakes like interrupting your interviewee, making assumptions without checking, asking questions, any questions maybe, but especially those that are not intimately connected to the narration. Again, fidelity. Every part of method has to be close to the reality. And in this case, you're asking a person about their experience. So questions unrelated to their, the narration of their experience is not so, yes, no questions. Well, they're not good, why? Because the person just says yes or no. What more information do they give you? You wanna get closer to their experience. And don't jump in for them, don't answer your own questions, uh, and don't focus on facts. Try to get the meanings, the purposes, the per what's really significant to the person and try to invite turn taping. Whenever turn taking, whenever you see an interview, that's interviewer, interviewee, interviewer, interviewee. No, that's too much interference. It should be mostly interviewee and very little interviewer, with from time to time clarifications, reflections, uh, and requests for greater detail, expressions of interest. Here are some interviews you can see. Focus groups are really interesting because especially when people might be inhibited to talk to one person and have the whole spotlight on them. Robert Merton, the sociologist, was the one who developed this method. And I know his daughter, he lived in the town that I lived in, Hastings on Hudson. And he developed this method, which is really tremendous when it comes to people who may be unfamiliar to the researcher and you set the stage for them and you tell them what your topic is, you tell them what your interest is, you let them know why you're interested and really let them know that you care about them and then you let them address your topic, you let them talk with each other about 
your research topic. And what you find is that the insider perspective, completely beyond the researcher, starts to flourish. There's a spontaneous interplay among participants, especially when these are people who are not used to voicing their experience. But with each other, they generate off each other. They play off each other. They resonate with each other. They even challenge each other. And you see a process there that's extremely uh, rich. And it's in this context that meanings can be revealed collectively. It's a form of data collection that really respects collective uh, participants and their collectivities. Here you see some photographs of focus groups. I want to let you know about the critical incident technique. Again, before there were, this is the first qualitative method that I've found that's developed as a method by a psychologist, John Flanagan. Uh, I've written on this. You can read Flanagan's amazing article, 1954, I believe. Hope I'm not wrong. It's around then. Uh, but he worked in World War II. And what he realized that was that the experts didn't know what they were doing. The surveys and all the questionnaires that were based on expert opinions weren't working in World War II. He decided that more concrete incidents of what works is important. His idea is, I want to know what works. I want to know how what makes a good combat leader. I want to know what makes a good dentist. I want to know what makes, uh, makes good nursing practice. I want to know what makes a good doctor or a good teacher or a good lawyer or a good educator. And so he asked people, his subjects, to give them an incident. Tell me a time when your nurse did something that was really wonderful, that really helped you. Tell me the best thing in this hospital stay that a nurse ever did for you. And he would collect thousands of these in incidents, and he would build his generalities out of these. And this would inform him about what good nursing practice is. He talked to soldiers about their combat leaders. Tell me an incident when your combat leader failed you, when your combat leader betrayed you, when your combat leader was not effective. And so he got incidences of great effectiveness, really good practices, good behaviors, and then incidences of bad ones. Like if you were talking to a migrant and you said, tell me something your lawyer did that was, that was not helpful at all and collect them. Tell me something a lawyer did that was really good for you and that achieved your goals and they give you incidents like that. This was the method that was used when the American Psychological Association developed their ethics code. And you can ask, professionals for times when they did things that were really effective. You can also ask those who they serve. Uh, Flanagan did research with students giving incidents of good teaching and bad teaching, but he also interviewed teachers and collected written descriptions. You can get these descriptions in any form uh, and, and got examples of uh, effective teaching, ineffective teaching, dentistry, uh, every profession. Uh, maybe just let me come back then again. Uh, very great technique. It's a data collection technique. He used induction to look at generalization across these examples. But what's great about it is the concreteness, the thickness of the description, uh, the again, fidelity, the closeness to reality. So I want to switch now and go to systems, uh, methodological systems. Now, what I mean by methodology. What is methodology? How is it different from methods? Well, methodological systems reflect on how is it that various approaches to knowing operate? What gives them credibility? What makes them faithful? Why do they work? And there are many different approaches that look at different systems of methods in terms of their logic, their validity, their reliability. Uh, what I would prefer to call their, their fidelity and their utility. And one of those systems developed by Amadeo Giorgi, we'll get into all these later, uh, phenomenological psychology. This is in psychology. I'm a psychologist. Grounded theory, discourse analysis, an approach that looks at language, narrative research, and participatory action research. Methods of analysis is probably the most difficult area of qualitative research. The good news about it is that 
people have done brilliant and wonderful analyses without knowing anything about the methods they were using. People like Du Bois, uh, Freud, uh, William James, uh, Gordon Alport, and, and even Flanagan started using his techniques before he ever had any kind of methodology, before he'd ever laid out any method. But now we have a lot of literature on methods so that we don't have to be as brilliant as all those people. We can read about analysis. We can be guided in the process of doing analysis. And yet these methods are just articulations of good thinking, good ways of knowing that we're capable of uh, as human beings. We're all phenomenologists. We're all interpreters. We're all able to think in grounded ways, to theorize, to focus on language and discourse, and to understand what it means to, 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 to hear and to create stories, interpretations, to appreciate and to ourselves produce artistic works. Another kind of approach to analysis is thematic analysis. So oftentimes in qualitative research, we talk about themes. Uh, if you were to uh, do a critical incident study or, uh, or a case study, you might see themes, things that keep recurring over and over again. Or you might be interested in how would I measure these things that I've been observing? One of the projects that I've been involved in, in order to try to clarify the methods of analysis, was to ask five pioneers of qualitative methods to all analyze the same interview. It was an interview given by a person who'd suffered uh, trauma. She was actually uh, a student of opera, about to have what she hoped was a tremendous operatic career. She developed cancer and had, uh, had a surgery, lost her voice completely, reinvented her life. And we had an interview that was actually, according to these researchers, a really poor interview. But the good news about that is that even poor interviews can yield brilliant analyses. And so we had five different researchers representing different approaches, all analyze the same interview. And then we even asked the participant, the person who gave the interview, the person whose experience was being analyzed, to read all these analyses and give her comment on them. What felt right? What felt wrong? How did she respond to these five analyses? And then these pioneer researchers read each other's analyses and compared them to each other. So this is a book that can help you compare various kinds of analyses with each other in a very concrete way, with concrete tools and procedures and how you do phenomenological psychology how you do grounded theory, one of our great grounded theorists, Kathy Sharma's Discourse Analysis by Linda McMullen, Narrative Research by Ruth Ellen Josselson, whose book on interviewing came out subsequently, and Intuitive Inquiry, a highly spiritual and artistic approach by Rose Marie Anderson. One of the great results of this work, I believe, was that there were so many commonalities among these kinds of analysis that one could actually do great qualitative research without becoming an expert in any one of these traditions, but draw on all of them because they really have so much in common. All these approaches were very reflexive. They all used concrete examples. They all looked at the data. Is the data faithful? Is the data really working for our purposes? What are its limits? They all tried to be transparent about how did we do what we did? They all started with openness. They all read their data again and again and again. There, in each approach was a sensitivity to the language and expression, to context. The ideas that came out of all these qualitative analytic procedures were what we call emergent. That is, they were rooted in the data, they came out of the data, rather than the researchers' preconceptions, any prior theories, any explanations, and all of them focused on meaning, the meanings of lived experience, to try to make those explicit, to differentiate them, to articulate them. And all of them were holistic. They tried to look at all the aspects of lived experience and to look at it as a whole, to look at the various parts or constituents and how they're all organized and to compare multiple examples and to look at 
differences and similarities, to make all knowledge claims grounded in evidence and to present that evidence so that readers see the fidelity to reality. And also to emphasize the research, the subjectivity of both the participants and the researchers and very self-critical. I have this slide, which does lay out some of the distinctive features of these various methods, so that if you're interested in the distinctiveness of each, you can delve into it and develop it if it's relevant to your research. But what I would say is that oftentimes it's the distinctiveness is less important than what all these analytic approaches share. I want to take a little excursion into phenomenology, which began in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s by Edmund Husserl, philosopher, originally a mathematician, and who, Husserl was dedicated to the science of lived experience. He believed it, it required radically different methods from the physical sciences. He believed that our scientific knowledge must be faithful to human beings, to their experience of the world, and we can't just hypothesize uh, how the brain affects their experience. We need to know their experience in and of itself. The reason why I focus on phenomenology, and I must admit that this is what I've been studying for almost 50 years now, because it's such a rich tradition. It's come down through over 100 years by now, and uh, it's really an ethical discipline. It's rooted in the insight that we need greater understanding of the world. We need knowledge that's not prejudiced. We need knowledge that's not driven by theories or prior scientific knowledge, let alone driven by inappropriate uh, physical material sciences. We, By universal knowledge, Husserl meant that we need to include everything, spirituality in our knowledge, lived experience of the world. We need to include human beings as individuals, as collectives. We need methods that study cultural artifacts. The aim is a science that gives us access to everything, that helps us know everything. Of course, it's an aspiration. It's an infinite task. Husserl was sometimes called the philosopher of infinite tasks. And this is an inquiry that's very independent. It's critical. It's open. It's faithful to human subjectivity. And it requires a shaping of methods, methods in all branches of philosophy and science. What's the purpose, Husserl says? It's the self-determination of humanity. This theme of self-determination is at the heart of liberation movements. It's at the heart of a genuinely humanistic interest in empowering people to play a role in the future of the world and making the world a better place for all of those people who are experiencing the world. So phenomenology requires refashioning political and social existence informed by free reason of all sorts, of expanded sorts in understanding humanity, recognizing in all persons and peoples their own inherent reason, their own inherent teleology, which means their purposes. And the purpose of the study is to promote their own self-determination. Phenomenology has offered methods in every discipline, virtually, so many of them, you see them here, and it's cross-disciplinary. That's another reason why I like it, is that it moves beyond, through, and in between all these different disciplines. There's literature on all these that you can draw upon. The basic principle of phenomenology is to go to the things themselves. It's the principle of fidelity itself. In other words, you need to go to the Mexican border. You need to go to the migrants. You need to go to the refugees. You need to go to the lawyers, to the doctors, to the policymakers, if you're interested in a topic that concerns those things. And when you go there, phenomenology means to let that which shows itself be seen from where? From your ideas, from previous theories, from, no, from the things themselves. How? In the very way that they show themselves from the people who are living through these realities. Heidegger says this maxim expresses the underlying principle of any scientific endeavor. So phenomenology is really just at root nothing other than science itself, but refashioned radically to study lived experience.
In the history of phenomenology, as new topics and interests have unfolded, it's transmuted itself in many different movements in different ways, transcendental, existential, hermeneutic, narrative, ethical, social, political, psychological, Africana, all phenomenology. Merleau-Ponty said, the way of learning phenomenology is to make phenomenology your own. So every researcher actually has the possibility of inventing phenomenology, or let's say reinventing it for himself or herself in whatever research context is taken up. Here are some core practices, but here we get into a little technical language, which I won't try to uh, talk too much about today. You can come back to this slide. If you're interested in these things, I've written on all this, and others have, of course, so much. But there's a real tradition in phenomenology of working with people who are struggling for liberation, who are struggling for power. Here we see uh, Simone de Beauvoir, who is a phenomenologist who wrote one of the first and greatest feminist manifestos, uh, The Second Sex, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, who was a mentor and colleague of France Fanon, uh, one of the great theorists and critics of colonialism. Uh, you can see how Sartre and de Beauvoir uh, went to the things themselves. They talked with Shea. Uh, they rode around the Cuban waters with Fidel Castro. The phenomenological method is not an invention. It's really just a systematization of ways that we understand lived experience naturally. And so it's not exclusively owned by phenomenologists. I believe that William James, W.E.B. Du Bois, and many other psychologists, like even B.F. Skinner and Abraham Maslow and Kohlberg, they're all using phenomenological methods, even though they've never studied it, and they don't characterize their methods that way, they're actually using it. So the value of phenomenology is to bring out implicit ways that people study lived experience when they're faithful to it, when they use procedures that are really uh, pragmatic, when they work. And so uh, phenomenology may be done with various levels of self-understanding and competence and all research on lived experience. But fortunately, there's all this literature that can fill, fill, fill libraries uh, on methodology, on practices, on methods uh, of integrating uh, theories, methods, and practices. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Georgie has done so much to uh, tell us procedures uh, for analyzing interviews, for analyzing descriptions in psychology. And the methods that he articulates as a phenomenologist are just the things that uh, we found that all qualitative researchers do. So it's nothing new. It's what everyone has always used. He's put his finger on it. He's broken it down into stages. He says, collect descriptions of concrete life events from people who have lived through them. Make them very as rich as they can be. Read them openly, empathize. Try to understand, reflect, and explicate the meanings of, of all the relevant data, of everything people tell you. Try to look for what is really important, what is essential. Try to understand the complexity, the full holistic structure of what your participants are telling you or what the pictures that you take show you, what a child's drawings are communicating, what's important in the drawing. Look at the genesis of experience. It's unfolding in time. Describe experience on various levels, the totally idiosyncratic level of individual experiences, incidents themselves. But also you can go to a higher level of generality, typicalities, like the, say the typical lawyer's experience, or maybe there are several types of experience of lawyers who are volunteering with refugees. Then you can go up at high general structures. Is there anything that all migrants share in common? What would that be? And then you articulate the implications of the findings for theory, practice, policy, and further research. Georgie tells us about these procedures. He's great at informing us. He says, suspend your knowledge of the topic. And well, I won't go through all these things, but notice in procedures, open reading, any good qualitative researcher is going to open read or open viewing of, of, of the photographs that you take. 
of the things you observe, of the people you meet, their expression. Demarcate meaning units, he's mostly talking about verbal data, but this could apply to any, any kind of data. Reflect on meaning of every part of it. He wants rigor. He says, don't ignore anything. Look at every detail of the drawing. Does that little thing in the corner mean anything of the, of the child's painting? And then synthesize all these reflections, synthesize all these thoughts about the meaning of what you're seeing, and then uh, develop generalizations, if that's part of the purpose of your research, which it may be or it may not be. So here's another uh, attempt to, uh, to lay out the, the operations of analytic reflection. I'm not going to take any more time with this since we're moving, uh, we're moving through this webinar. Here are some, some procedures for formulating, when I say structural findings, I mean findings that are really integrative of all the various meanings that you've grasped, that you've found in reflection. Uh, seeing the general features of individual instances, things like comparing different, you know, like Flanagan did. He compared the really effective practices to the ineffective practices. What do the effective ones share in common? What do the ineffective ones share in common? And noting what's invariant in each of those. In other words, all the effective practices involve this. And they all may work in this way, in that way, in that way. The ineffective ones, these are the flaws. The co you know, like I was talking about interviewing before, common mistakes. That's Rufellen's uh, uh, noting of the invariant features of the bad interview when she's seen so many different transcripts from her students and others. And she's done this. She's articulated various levels of generality. I also want to put a call out to hermeneutics, which is rooted in phenomenology. We have uh, a precursor of phenomenology, Schleiermacher and Diltai. Uh, Schleiermacher was interpreting sacred texts, religious texts. He realized that the Bible and other uh, sacred texts require interpretation. Diltai said all human sciences, in fact, every understanding of lived experience requires interpretation. Heidegger, the phenomenologist, the student and assistant of Husserl, also came to the same conclusion. Phenomenology is about interpretation. So that's why we have hermeneutic phenomenology uh, of Paul Ricoeur. The two ideas that are really great from hermeneutics come this way. It's called the hermeneutic circle. And it's used in two ways to describe the iterative process of interpretation. One of them is that we move through interpretation from our previous knowledge of what we're studying, called foreknowledge by Heidegger, through a fresh reading, observation, uh, photograph viewing, uh, whatever it might be, to an enhanced view. And every time we read through a description, we gain new insights. We gain new understandings. So there's this, we go back, we read it again, and we learn even more. We go back to the child's drawing. We put line the child's drawings up, line up drawings from different children, and we look at them in relation to each other. And each one gives us a new reading, a new interpretation, a new understanding that goes beyond our preconceptions and then forms a whole new set of preconceptions and foreknowledge, which is itself uh, iteratively revised uh, with every new investigation. And that's one hermeneutic circle. The other one that Schleiermacher uh, invented, not invented, because none of these procedures are invented. They're articulations of the ways we understand lived experience naturally. And that is the movement back and forth from the part to the whole. If you're reading a description, you look at each statement in relation to the entire narrative. You look at sections of the narrative in relation to each other. You keep going back and forth from part to whole, to whole to part. What's the function of this part in the whole? You might see a temporal unfold. Oh, this is the beginning. This is the middle. This is the end. We have a narrative structure. And the beginning, middle, and end are parts of a whole narrative of a migrant's journey from oppression and fear to hope or through captivity. Uh, and so the part-whole relationships and the complex process of lived experience can be known through this movement back and forth from the parts to the whole. Here's Schleiermacher and Diltai. Paul Ricoeur, phenomenological 
hermeneutician and also narrative. Uh, the narrative tradition is rooted in, in hermeneutics as interpretation of language. I want to call attention to grounded theory developed by Glasser and Strauss. One of the great things about grounded theory is they say, oh, don't even do a literature review. Why? Because it could affect your view of what you're studying. Go right there and observe it. Collect descriptions. Do interviews. Take photographs. Uh, talk to people who are immersed in the experience. Uh, don't even look at what the academicians have said or the theories about it all. Uh, interesting, uh, very radical. Uh, go there and every throughout the research, write yourself memos, keep journals. Uh, it's the researchers' ongoing notes. They talk a lot about analysis, open coding. Uh, you know, categorization means, you know, what's the category? What's the idea? What is this particular thing that the person is saying about? Like I had mentioned, for instance, captivity or oppression in, in, the, in the temporal uh, life uh, of a refugee. Uh, axial coding has to do with comparing these open codes and looking at how they interrelate with each other. And then theory construction specifying functional relationships. Okay, so he, these are the things that lead uh, migrants to a better life. Here are the things that make migrants' life deplorable and horrible and, and makes migration unsuccessful. Or here's a theory of the practice of lawyers with, with migrants, a theory about it, specifying the functional relate. What are the important things that lead to the successes the things that lead to the failures, a theory. And then but go back, check that theory, get more data. Uh, and then after you've done all that, then review the literature. And then you might realize that a completely different literature than you ever would have reviewed at the outset is actually more relevant to your topic than you ever would have known. Uh, so it's an innovations by grounded theory. Here's Glasser and Strauss and their book. Mixed methods, integrating quantitative and qualitative methods. I want to point out some uses of qualitative research in relation to quantitative. Qualitative research can inform us of what is important to measure. So we can use qualitative research to inform our construction of surveys. Measuring, and, you know, did you ever wonder, where do they get these questions on the survey that they're giving everyone? Uh, and sometimes the question is, you ever take a survey and just said, what the heck are they asking all these questions for? Well, if good qualitative research had informed that survey, the questions would often be posed out of the language of people who have lived through the experience. And if that's really useful, if we have not only fidelity to them, but utility, those questions are going to work to fulfill the purposes of knowing people who are taking the survey. So they'll read the question and say yes or no, and it'll be really revelatory whether they say yes or no. So that you have a survey and quantitative research, then you can say, well, these, this percentage of the population answered the questions these way or this way. Uh, you know, 5% of the migrants were happy with their legal services, and these are the things that made them happy. These are the things that made them sad, and you can quantify all that. Qualitative methods can also elucidate the personal meanings of quantitative results. When we have survey data, we can go back to people who answered the survey and say, hey, you know, when you answered this question this way, give me an example of that from your lived experience, and we can know what the meaning of those statistics and the big data, the population level data, what that means at the level of an individual living through these experiences. Again, uh, mixed methods. I want to finish now by going to ethics and start with the historical abuse of human subjects uh, research. It's amazing, actually, that ethics are relatively recent, really within the last 50 years. It's also amazing how legitimate research has been that we now view as ethically objectionable. The British Army doing research on mustard gas with Irish people, poor Indian subjects, uh, without any regard to their well-being. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment, which we'll take a look at some pictures of, where 600 African Americans were studied from 1932 all the way to 1972, 
That's less than 50 years ago. And they were, they were told, uh, they were not told that they had syphilis. And the point of the research was to look at the natural course of syphilis among people who were denied treatment. In other words, they could have cured their syphilis. They didn't do it. They just wanted to study what happens to them when they're not treated. And they were deceptive. Deceptive. They were told that they were being treated for bad blood, which was totally made up. There was no bad blood. Actually, they did have bad blood, but they weren't being treated for it. Uh, Nazi experimentation, the famous Milgram experiment, uh, the Zimbardo Stanford uh, prison experiment, which there was a movie on recently. There's a great document on Milgram's ex documentary, documentary on Milgram's experiment. You can watch these on YouTube, uh, all of them, if you want to. Here you see the Tuskegee syphilis experiment with uh, people being uh, studied in the field, uh, people with syphilis. Uh, really, really horrible stuff. This is in Alabama. Here you see the Nazi experimentation, uh, Joseph Mengele. Terrible abuses, no regulation. The Milgram experiment, where people were invited into an experiment that was supposedly on learning by punishment and the research subjects through uh, a kind of rigged procedure were always made the teacher who would shock the learner for every incorrect answer that the learner gave and would go all the way up a shock generator until the panel of the generator uh, went to moderate, severe, dangerous, and at the end of the panel, XXX. I mean, to me, that's death. They would have to do it under some conditions, putting the person's hand on the shock panel. Other conditions where they couldn't see the participant. Uh, here you see a man who went all the way and he thought he'd killed somebody. Uh, he didn't realize that he was the one being studied. He hadn't hurt anybody at all. And it's amazing to watch this, how it dawns on him when the experimenter comes out and tells him that he hasn't actually hurt anybody. Really interesting. But uh, the ethics of research has been of concern through a series of projects to lay out what's right, what's wrong in research on human beings and on animals as well. And so the Nuremberg Code goes back to 1947. That's the first ethical code. The Declaration of Helsinki, the National Research Act, you can see the Belmont Report. There have been a series of, uh, of ethical projects. The American Psychological Association has revised their code of ethics numerous times. My colleague here at Fordham, Celia Fisher, chaired the, uh, the panel uh, revising it the second to last time. And they use Flanagan's critical incident uh, method to do so in each revision. And what's come out of this is now the establishment of a governmental office of human research protections, uh, and they oversee all research that's done. Uh, you can look here at the Nuremberg Code and some of the principles that came out of it, like the idea that every participant in research should be informed about the study. Uh, and research must be good for society. That might rule, uh, you know, who knows whether research is good for society. That's a tough one. So research ethics are fraught with dilemmas uh, and debates. Research must be human research. This is for medicine. Uh, don't experiment with human beings until animals have been used. But then again, what about ethical treatment of animals? What about the use of animals? Is that ethical? Another issue. Researcher must avoid injury, harm, and pain. Uh, suffering and injury is major ethical problem. In fact, any discomfort that you may see in your research participants that may be evoked by uh, your interview in the focus group, all of that is very important. And it's the researcher's responsibility to address any kind of suffering or any potential harm that may come uh, from the research. Researchers should be qualified, should be trained, should be prepared, and freedom. Any research subject should be free to discontinue the research at any time without any penalty and without any repercussions. And it's really important for the researcher to be trustworthy and to let them know that it's okay if they want to stop. The researcher can't be coercive. 
uh, the Declaration of Helsinki says that uh, the well-being always is takes precedence over the science. You may think you're gaining great knowledge by this research, but if someone's well-being is compromised, don't do it. It's wrong. Even if you think society may really benefit from the research, the well-being of each person takes precedence over that. I mean, of course, that's something that some ethicists argue has to be debated. You have a kind of a cost-benefit model. What's the cost to subjects versus the benefit to society? But the Helsinki Declaration said, nope, society's benefit does not trump the well-being of the subject. So respect for persons, protection of subjects. Vulnerable populations require special protection, and migrants and refugees are absolutely vulnerable populations. Children are vulnerable populations. Procedures should be detailed before the research. They should be reviewed by others because there's always a chance that a researcher will be serving himself or herself and isn't being, isn't being sufficiently sensitive to the interests and well-being of the participants. The Belmont Report, Beneficence, Justice, Respect for Persons. The Office for the Protection of Human Subjects is still active and functioning. And here are some of the uh, principles. If you're working in an institution, get their permission. You might also wonder, well, what if you're working in an institution that wouldn't give you permission? And, you know, is it ethical to work without their permission? I mean, these are sensitizing issues. Uh, ordinarily, we want permission, but how about if the institution is unethical and we wonder about their concealing the truth and uh, we are aiming to help the well-being and advocate for people who may be trapped in an unjust institution that's not going to offer permission. I think we need to always be reflecting on these ethical issues. Uh, IRB protocols, we'll get to the IRB in a minute, that's the Institutional Review Board. Most universities, all universities, hospitals have uh, institutional review board that review proposals for research and, uh, and approve or disapprove or require revisions in research projects. Uh, recruiting and selecting participants. Think about that carefully. Uh, is it coercive? That's bad. Uh, is it fair? Uh, if there's a benefit to research, does everybody have an equal opportunity? Uh, are you selecting a sufficiently diverse population of research participants? Always be aware of risks of harm, whether physical, psychological. Think about it in terms of temporary versus long-term. Uh, and generally, we try not to have any more than minimal Harm. I mean, it may be very difficult for a person to review and to give a story of their trauma. They may break down as they're talking about the most horrible things they've ever experienced. People with PTSD may relive their trauma and have terrible uh, experiences in the course of their narrative. And that's, that's, that's a risk. That's something we need to have procedures to ameliorate. And we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Is it right? Uh, what do we do when it happens? How do we take care of people who go through those kinds of experiences? Uh, is, is it temporary? That, that when something is, has potential for long-lasting harm, uh, it's ruled out. If there's any damage, long-term damage from the research, don't do it. So uh, minimal and temporary suffering uh, is really pretty, as a rule of thumb, the only even the only thing to even think about, uh, whether it's worth it. Deception is not recommended. Any kind of uh, not full disclosure uh, beforehand. Now, we know there's research that uh, experiments that require that the subject is naive, the participant is naive. Sometimes deception is allowed in research, but it's only allowed when there's absolutely no suffering and absolutely no chance of any harm, temporary or lasting. The combination of deception and any risk of harm is ruled out by every IRB. They're not allowing it at all. Uh, maybe you could deceive if 
there if there's only temporary suffering you really have to justify it very strongly keeping confidence protecting the privacy so we have procedures to make sure the participants names things that would identify them institutions are not named because bad repercussions can come out of the dissemination of the research and we don't want anybody institutions collectives groups to be very careful about what we publish, the knowledge we disseminate. And we have to think about the use of the knowledge and uh, how it might affect the participants. And this is often why de-individuation or taking out revealing aspects to protect privacy is really important. Thinking about the costs and benefits of research uh, to, you know, uh, I've known researchers who, who, who would say, that if they did a study of educational programs in prison and they found that the educational programs didn't have a benefit, they wouldn't publish that because they don't want people to develop the idea that education in prisons is a bad thing to do. And they might just overgeneralize the way people do uh, and use that study against prisoners. And so they wouldn't publish it. They wouldn't sacrifice the scientific value of the study for the well-being of the people who might be affected in some way. So ethical protection requires real reflection and requires collaboration. Here's where the participants themselves are great consultants about who should get this information. Is there any information here that you would not want to see disseminated? So uh, telling participants beforehand what's gonna be involved. But you know what, the, the ethical informed consent is throughout the entire process. Maybe uh, participants should also consent after they know what the results of the research are, not just before, and give permission to even de disseminate it. And also the right to refuse and to discontinue participation at, at any time. So, uh, ethics of interviewing. You can take a look at this. We're coming near the end, so I'm gonna start speeding up a little. We are near the end. But voluntariness, informed consent, the right to withdraw, debriefing, and expression of gratitude, very, very important. Here's the IRB. When there's any deception, when there's any chance of any risk of harm or suffering, the full board reviews every proposal. When there's only minimal risk, and it's, there's no deception, and it may be temporary uh, at best, and usually these are no risk, but minimal as anything. And then the board may, re the, the, the IRB may review it without the full board. And then there's research that's exempt, that doesn't have to be reviewed, but the researcher doesn't determine that. The IRB does, because the re every researcher could say, hey, my, my research is, is exempt. Uh, others have to do that. Here's a slide that maps out the process of IRB application from the initial proposal through the uh, initial review with feedback to the researcher, the determination of whether it's exempt or it requires uh, whether it's expedited and can be approved by the chair of the IRB or whether it requires full board approval. And in the end, the process can go back and forth numerous times and will end with the study approved. Here again, I have the structure of a research project, but I'm gonna move through this uh, to the acknowledgements of uh, Mary Beth Morrissey, the principal investigator of this wonderful project that has been funded and supported by APA, CODAPAR, and has Sarah Mancole, our, our wonderful SQIP, host uh, of the webinar and uh, all the people who have been involved in this project and the institutions, which you can take a look at. And again, if you're not listed, let us know, we'll revise it. And here I offer the bibliographic resources and many of these articles I have in PDF again. So if any of you don't have access to libraries, email me, I can send you a lot of these things. And uh, here's another screen that you can return to once this is recorded and to get these references. Uh, again, I can provide them, many of them, and would be happy to do so. And so at this point, I will thank you for listening to all this and thank invite you. you. So much. <laughs> and invite you to contact me if there's any more information on any of these topics that you want. 
here is my email address, my website. Check it out. I love these photographs of the little girl who is inside the mother drawn on the ground. Uh, amazing kids who reveal what they need, what they want. And the other picture of the sun and the heart at the end of the road of the migration. So I'll end on that positive note and turn it back to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. I learned so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Wirtz. Um, we do have a few minutes on a quiet Friday afternoon. So if you do have a question or two, please type it into the chat box and uh, we can answer a question or two. Um, you also have Dr. Wirtz's email there, so you can follow up with him afterward as well. And after this webinar ends, I will send out a link to the recording and a PDF of the slides so that you can pause it and take a closer look on any of the slides that interest you. And I'm, put, uh, I'm putting up the yeah. structure of the research process so that you can look at these various aspects of it that might raise questions. Uh, so here you see a kind of a map of the whole thing. The order is not always like this, but this may be the most traditional. But I always advocate uh, overturning tradition in the service of fidelity and uh, pragmatic utility. We want research that's faithful to what we're studying, that's close to reality, and that really works for the purposes of self-determination and the shaping of our destiny through the knowledge. And everything in method is revisable based on those deep principles of design and evaluation. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions come in. Um, let me just check one more place. Um, we did get a question. Um, the person writes, I'm interested in knowing if there are any best practices for qualitative research ethics around the privacy of data and the length of data collection. Yes, and they're not on the tip of my tongue right now, but I would say uh, direct you to uh, the, the SQIP website, and the SQIP is, a, is the Society for Qualitative Research in Psychology, and uh, it's a section of Division Five, qualitative, quantitative and qualitative methods, and SQIP is working on things like that. Uh, issues of ethics in privacy and archives. Uh, there is a literature on it. I would really recommend the wonderful journal, uh, the Qu Qualitative Psychology. That's an APA journal published by SQIP, and Ruth Ellen Josselson is the editor of that journal. I would suggest looking at the table of contents. And of course, literature reviews will always be a good way to look for articles on that. I'm sure there is a literature on it. And I apologize that I don't have studies on the tip of my tongue. Uh, but the other thing I would say about that is that we're really in an exciting time when ethical questions are being raised and asked and answered in new ways. And ethical issues like that, all ethical issues, are more problems uh, than anything else. And so there's a really need for ever more thought, uh, for ever more review of the literature, critical literature review on the ethics of data collection, uh, making archives public. There's a big debate on whether uh, we ought to put out uh, on websites and share uh, for other researchers uh, data. You know, I had a student who was doing research on schizophrenia that was cross-cultural, and she had very much in-depth uh, research uh, interviews with uh, people diagnosed with schizophrenia in New York City, in the Bronx, in the United States, and in Israel, in Jerusalem. And they were Arabs, they were Jews, they were uh, Israelis, they were Palestinians. And she had the most fantastic uh, interviews that would have been wonderful for uh, researchers and even myself. I would like to go back and read that interview, read those interviews again and work on the findings and, and revisit them again and again. But we can't do that because her procedural plan and the IRBs 
of all those hospitals where she was interviewing schizophrenics in both Israel and New York City said, no, you have to destroy the data because even if you de-individuate it, you know, there was a man, for instance, who had what, uh, what a kind of schizophrenia uh, that tourists develop along uh, the wall in Israel, in Jerusalem. Uh, what's the name of it? Um, it's not occurring to me now, but it's a something syndrome. It's like Jerusalem syndrome, yes. And they develop uh, delusions that they may be a religious figure and they start preaching at the wall. And she had a couple of people who were suffering in uh, Jerusalem hospitals with that, uh, that disorder. And uh, the hospital said, you know, if people, no matter what you do to de-individuate it, not give the person's name, people are gonna know who that person is. They're still out there preaching at the wall and there's a risk there. So they required that, that all that uh, data be destroyed and it is destroyed, but it would have been very valuable as an archive. But again, the research participants well-being trumps uh, the, uh, uh, the scientific value and the societal value. So I just say that again, the sharing of data so, and, and another uh, great uh, dialogue on the sharing of data, this is a good one, uh, from our five ways of doing qualitative research. What was so interesting was when we gave uh, our analyses to the person whose experience we were analyzing, and we'd called her Teresa, uh, the opera singer who was strict stricken with uh, uh, cancer. Uh, she read our analyses and she said, who is this Teresa? I've, I don't even know anybody by that name. It's outrageous that you're calling me Teresa. And she said, I want to be called by my own name. And the IRB said, no, no, no. She criticized her doctors. People could find out who they are. Yeah, she said things about her parents that were unbelievable. And she said, I'll go talk to them all. I'll tell them what I've said. I've confronted them all already. And it's important to me that I own my experience. And she argued for that. So we debated it, you know. Uh, so the sharing of data is very debatable. It's very tricky. And we ended up with a kind of a, a compromise solution where we continued to call her Teresa and all the aspects of the analysis where we knew her as Teresa, but in the chapters she wrote where she spoke with her own voice, uh, we allowed her to use her own name and it's Emily McSpadden and she's a co-author of Five Ways. So we not only have the five researchers, but we have six co-authors and Emily McSpadden, the real name of the participant, uh, is is revealed in the book. And I was a strong advocate of letting Emily use her own name. Again, to me, uh, the empowerment and existential values of participants is extremely important. But uh, reflection, critical reflection on ethics is always called for. And so I think whatever literature you find on uh, data sharing and privacy and all those issues, is a fraught literature, one that I would encourage you to read critically and to think about critically when you do research. Uh, there's no literature that would justify anything. <laughs> you, you have to think it through originally. Uh, and most of all, consult other people. With any ethical issue, the most important thing to do is to talk to other people because we all have blind spots when it comes to knowing what's good and what's right. And so that multiple stakeholders, the most diverse group of consultants, is the best way to know if you're missing something. And uh, of course, even consensus. I know once, I, I, I remember my daughter saying, you know, there's a problem with democracy. The majority can be wrong. Uh, and that's true too. So consensus is not necessarily a justification. Uh, we have to think through things for ourselves. and and in collaboration with the communities who are stakeholders in the research we're doing. And there's no general uh, formulation that, that should override that kind of uh, open, critical, shared community uh, inquiry. So that's what I would say about all that. And um, if we, I can get one more question in, um, we got another really interesting question that I think will be relevant to people on the webinar. Um, it is, do you have any recommendations for professionals in the field, for example, nurses, chaplains, therapists, who want to conduct research but do not have an academic degree that includes a background in research? 
Well, that's absolutely fantastic, and I love the question. And I, I don't have a, na a list of names for you, but I know that uh, that university researchers have a responsibility now to be going to people who use our knowledge, who implement our knowledge, and to form partnerships with them. You know, I think it's really the responsibility of every researcher to think about possibilities for sharing your capacities with the capacities of those who are professionals in the areas of the research, forming relationships with them, as, 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 as we mentioned in the webinar about community-based research. Very important that it's based on relationships. Uh, here at Fordham, for instance, uh, we encourage our faculty to go all over New York City and to engage ourselves with uh, doctors, nurses, lawyers, dentists, teachers in schools and prisons, and uh, Michelle Fine, uh, one of our colleagues in SQIP, has done wonderful research in prisons where graduate students have formed relationships with prisoners and done uh, participatory action research uh, on uh, various aspects of prison life. And so, you know, I think that uh, that that every researcher can think about the utility of their research and their knowledge out in the real world. Who would be the people who might receive this knowledge? And those would be people, whether nurses, doctors, hospitals, whoever, that you can form a relationship with and actually do research with them. Uh, I have a colleague uh, in uh, the, the Yale School of Medicine, phenomenologist Larry Davidson, who does phenomenological action research on schizophrenia who uh, works with psychiatrists in the community, uh, nurses in psychiatric hospitals, community organizers who have day centers for recovering schizophrenics. He develops uh, programs for recovering schizophrenics and in collaboration with schizophrenics themselves. He actually teaches them phenomenological methods and they've learned those phenomenological methods. So he's not doing research on them, he's doing research with them. And he's using his capacity as a teacher to capacitate schizophrenics to investigate their own experience and each other's experience. And he's not only published and had uh, federal funding for this research, which has generated new programs for recovery all over New Haven and hopefully in other places as well. And he studied the experience of schizophrenics in hospitals as well. And uh, he also had a group of researchers in his, his lab, the schizophrenics themselves, who took the results of their phenomenological analyses and they wrote dramas uh, and presented uh, performance pieces uh, as theater to the communities of New Haven, uh, hope, hoping to educate people in communities about what's going on with schizophrenics, what's going on in the community centers where schizophrenics are going during the day, uh, residence facilities where they're living. And so that people could watch these plays that were performed by the researchers, by recovering schizophrenics themselves and uh, embodying their own voices as uh, that itself embodies the knowledge of uh, the analyses of phenomenological psychology. Uh, Dave, Larry Davidson is a student of Amadeo Giorgi, uh, my mentor from Duquesne University. Uh, and uh, it's a good example of a person in New Haven and the Yale Medical School who's formed relationships with community organizers, with psychiatrists, with with, uh, with people uh, who are uh, uh, designing and developing uh, programs for uh, schizophrenics and with schizophrenics themselves and who have used all kinds of dissemination, including uh, literary works, poetry, uh, performance pieces, art, as well as scientific articles published in top peer-reviewed journals. Well, thank you so much. Um, as I said, I'm going to be sending around the slides and a link to the recorded webinar. And I will also send you all information in a little bit on our next webinar in early to mid-March. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Worth. Oh, you're all welcome. I hope it was helpful. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye now.